Thank you. All right, so first of all, a little bit about affiliations. So as Nelson said, I'm at Montana State University. We have uh, there the Extreme Gravity Institute. I'm the director of uh, the institute there. And I've also added a logo because I'm, as of uh, basically next week, I will be on sabbatical for a year um, down in Nice with Nelson and Marianne. And so it's going to be a uh, good year. And I'm a member of Nanograv, the North American Nanohertz Gravitational, Way, uh, Gravitational Observatory. Um, in addition to being part of LIGO and uh, on the LISA science team. So today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about pulsar timing. <coughs> so we heard a little from uh, Cliff Will yesterday about pulsar timing. I'm actually going to recover some of the ground that Cliff covered. Uh, the basic idea in this cartoon here is that you've got a pulsar. This is a slowly rotating pulsar, uh, what we call classical pulsar, where by some mechanism that's not entirely well understood, uh, generates a radio beam, lighthouse type effect, and when that uh, beam sweeps into our line of sight, we get a, a radio pulse. And uh, you know these are rotating neutron stars, uh, ra rotating very rapidly, so they're incredibly uh, high angular momentum, so it's a great flywheel, making it a very good consistent clock, right? Because it's just a, a very, heavy object, a uh, very high angular momentum um, rotating rapidly. So, I'm oh sorry, I meant to say very high moment of inertia. So they're, they're excellent clocks. And we use them then uh, as natural clocks for detecting gravitational waves. As Martin mentioned yesterday, if you had just fantastically good clocks, you wouldn't need lasers to do gravitational wave detection. And that's basically the principle by un, uh, that we have. And the nice thing is that the universe built this detector for us. So it came pre-made. <coughs> it was, cons you know, <coughs> uh, and it's uh, we have pulsars scattered throughout the galaxy that we use. <coughs> Just to <coughs> remind you of where this all fits in, you'll be hearing more today about the space detectors. You've heard a lot about the ground-based detectors, and here we are with pulsar timing down in the uh, nanohertz uh, frequency range. If you prefer to think in terms of periods, we're talking periods anywhere between sort of months up to many decades, right? <coughs> so uh, patience is the name of the game in pulsar timing. When you're looking for something that has a period of four or five years, you have to accumulate several complete cycles to make any kind of a detection. So these, are, these projects have a long history and uh, takes a long time to get there. The principal target in this <coughs> region are going to be supermassive black hole binaries at the center of galaxies. <coughs> so outline of what I'm going to cover today, talk a little bit about the history and the status and where we're going in pulsar timing, say a little bit about what they, um <coughs> what pulsars are and why we focus on a particular subclass called millisecond pulsars. I'll go into a little bit about observing pulsars and uh, then into the timing model, how we can actually predict when the next pulse is going to arrive and say something about the noise sources that uh, corrupt the measurements <coughs> and make the analysis quite challenging. I've listed some resources. I'll be posting the slides so you can go and uh, check these out. Uh, I've taken various bits of material from a re review articles listed here. There's also a paper, there's a, there's a software package called Tempo and Tempo2 that is used to do a lot of the pulsar timing analysis and the uh, compendium paper that describes the timing model is, is a very nice resource if you want to understand uh, all the terms I'm going to look I'm going to put a few equations in today, but if you want all the details, you can find it in this paper. And if you really want to, yeah, Alberto's here. <laughs> so uh, if you want to, uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about the data analysis and pulsar timing tomorrow. If you actually want to get involved, there's a very nice analysis suite that's been put together called Enterprise. And there's a, uh, Steve Taylor has made a video tutorial that you can watch. And it takes you through, you know, how to, how to use this package. And there's exercises you can find on GitHub where you can then actually, and the, all of these data sets are public. So you can actually download the data and do the analyses and 
and mess around it. And, and so these tutorials are great and uh, Steve's video will get you going. So you can, uh, if you really want to get into this, there is a lot of resources being developed to help you uh, get started. <coughs> all right, back to the beginning here. Uh, it all started back in 1967, uh, before I was born, when the uh, first millisecond pulsar, sorry, the first pulsar was detected. Here's the uh, recording uh, paper with the pulses, and uh, this is the first observation. <coughs> and Jocelyn Bell here pictured in front of the, uh, I guess it must have been some kind of like a dipole array outside of Cambridge that uh, was with the um, first detection of pulsars. I think uh, this detection is probably <coughs> uh, most famous for the fact that Jocelyn Bell, who who actually made the the first uh, these measurements and realized there was something funny going on, uh, was left out from the Nobel Prize for the discovery. Uh, so, <coughs> it's still there. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's a nice piece of history there. <coughs> and of course, when, the <coughs> when this was first discovered, with this sort of r regular pulses coming from some uh, extra you know, solar object, well, they actually didn't even know where it was from, they had there was all sorts of wild theories about uh <coughs> what might have been causing this, including uh, you know, signals from extraterrestrial intelligences. So <coughs> it took a while before people figured out what could be um, the source of, of these. Now, uh, the, uh, I, w I actually credit, I think, uh, Steve Detweiler um, as being, as really the inventor of, of the idea of pulsar timing detection, a very nice paper that uh, Steve wrote while he was still at Yale, and uh, he was saying that, so basically, people had already talked about using Doppler tracking of spacecraft, so taking the radio signals from, um, from spacecraft and and uh, use those to actually find delays caused by gravitational waves, and that formalism was developed by Estabrook and Walquist in 1975. And there had also been a um, an earlier mention in a paper by a, a Russian uh, physicist that was um, a more uh, limited kind of geometry for the configuration of where the pulsar might be. But anyway, the uh, he talks about um, setting. Uh, limits on the energy density of, of um, gravitational waves from the pulsar observations. And so this was a, um, and he also actually suggests using cross correlation from the signals between a number of pulsars to actually distinguish signal from noise, sort of setting up the basis of the technique that we actually use to do the analysis. And uh, it sets the first upper limits. So not just, you know, suggesting this might be a method for doing it, but actually took the data that was available at the time but back then, pulsar timing was not very precise. The time of arrivals were only measured to sort of 100 millisecond type accuracy. So correspondingly, the limits that he was able to produce were not very, uh, not very strong limits. Because <coughs> you, what you do to produce these limits is you just say, just imagine that the entire fluctuation in the arrival time of the pulses is being caused by gravitational waves, right? Sort of saturate it to say, if I attribute all of that noise to gravitational waves, that would be the level of the stochastic background of gravitational waves. Of course, we know there's many other noise sources, so it's not really gravitational waves that are causing a 100 millisecond fluctuation, but that's how you set an upper limit. Yes? <coughs> uh, I think he was thinking more cosmological, perhaps, but, uh, you know, to be honest, it's a little while since I read the paper, so I forget but I don't think he mentioned to my, I don't know if anyone's read it more recently or has a better memory than I do, but I don't recall him mentioning supermassive black hole, like a background from supermassive black holes, but uh, it's a paper that's worth reading if you, uh, it would be good to find out what, what he actually was thinking about. I think it was more, uh, more cosmological. Now, <coughs> moving forward a little bit in time to 1982, uh, was the discovery of the first millisecond pulsar so pre previous to that, pulsar periods had tended to be more in the sort of uh, second type range, and all of a sudden they had one that was rotating at an incredibly fast rate. Um, 
with a period of 1.558 milliseconds, <coughs> and uh, and this was <coughs> this was very interesting because <coughs> it was a entirely different. You know, how would you get a pulsar rotating this quickly? <coughs> This was the situation at that time in 1982. These were the known pulsars at the time. You see most of them were clustered around periods of roughly a second down to maybe a tenth of a second. <coughs> and here was that first detection of a millisecond pulsar. What we're looking at here is this is the pulsar period and this is the log of the period derivative, right? So how rapidly the pulsar, pulsar period is changing with time. Now they, <coughs> I'll get more into this in a moment, but the pulse the pulsars are spinning down because they're, you know, emitting, um, well, they have these electromagnetic fields, they're driving winds, so they're spinning down, so their their periods are not fixed, they are, they are changing with time. Anyway, <coughs> I'll get a bit more into that later. This is the situation today, so more, I think there's now somewhere around 3,000 pulsars known um, in the galaxy, <coughs> and we have now a collection of <coughs> millisecond pulsars as well. And you notice that these millisecond pulsars <coughs> have very low period derivatives, so their periods are changing very slowly with time. <coughs> yes? <coughs> um. <coughs> well, <coughs> They're not these days. Um, I mean, there's, I guess they're a smaller subpopulation is, is one of the things. Plus, you've got to be able to actually, uh, you know, it might be some issue about just resolving the, that rapid period, right? Your analysis has to uh, account for that. I actually don't know exactly the answer about why they were so difficult to detect at first. Bruce, do you have a... <coughs> right. <coughs> right. <coughs> hmm. Just a computational Right, and actually, <coughs> and I'll I'll get to this as we go along, but that actually <coughs> goes to a similar problem, uh, which is just showing you the the role that higher power computing can can play in science. Uh, binary pulsars, including the double pulsar that Cliff was talking about yesterday, <coughs> to detect a a double pulsar, you've got to actually solve. You have to search <coughs> over all possible binary orbits because you have to take out the binary motion to actually get the pulses to line up. And that becomes a very big computational problem because not because now you actually have to, when looking for the pulses, you have to also be trying out all possible orbital models. And it just was computationally too expensive to do. And it, you know, as computing power got greater, that's actually, they'd already surveyed, for example, the region of the sky where the double pulsar <coughs> was discovered had been observed many times before and they'd never actually detected it just because their data analysis wasn't up to it. It wasn't that it wasn't bright enough, it's just that they couldn't stack the pulses together and so it was a data analysis issue. So as Bruce was saying, I guess it was a data analysis issue back in the day that they weren't sampling, you know, a data acquisition, right. In the case of the, uh, the binary pulsar, it, the double pulsar, it's a, a data analysis. Well, it's sort of acquisition too because you need to well, it's more analysis because you have to fold the pulses with that model. <coughs> yes? <coughs> well, I think that the sampling rates now are, you know, much, much faster. Uh, so I think that, I again, I'm, I'm guessing a little here, but I would, you know, you <coughs> if you take the, uh, if you went all the way up to like the 
the breakup rotation rate for a neutron star and figure out what how fast that would be, I think that that's still well within the capabilities of what people could detect today. So I don't think it's a lack of sampling now that prevents us. I think it's actually that pulsars just don't spin that fast. I just don't. In fact, I think this is right. I don't think. I think that first binary pulsar, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think it's still the fastest known uh, millisecond pulsar. And we've not found anything spinning faster than that one so far. We probably will eventually, but so far it's the record holder, which is kind of weird that the very first one was the fastest. But So there is a new, a new faster one? <coughs> this was Aiden. There might be another one. I thought that was that one. Yeah. Maybe this doesn't include, maybe that's more recent than this graph. Um, but certainly it was on the very high end. Maybe it's been beaten just more recently since this figure was made. <coughs> All right, moving forward another year. So that was 1982 when the first millisecond pulsar was discovered. In 1983, Ron Hellings <coughs> and I think it's George Downs um <coughs> at... Uh, at JPL wrote a paper that uh, calculated that if you have a gravitational wave signal or s an isotropic stochastic um, background of gravitational waves, <coughs> the each pulsar is going to get disturbed by the gravitational waves. And it makes sense that if two pulsars <coughs> are almost at the same direction in the sky from you, they their time delay should be very similar because they're in essentially getting the same, you know, seeing the same gravitational wave signal there. <coughs> so the correlation, um, they're highly correlated if they're at zero separation, but then they actually calculated the correlation as a function of angle. You see it actually dips to negative and then goes back to positive again for 180 degrees, pulsars 180 degrees apart. And so this correlation pattern which is characteristic of, you know, it's caused by the quadrupole nature of the gravitational wave. This is the sort of smoking gun signature that we're looking for in pulsar timing because we're looking for, uh, there's many other sources of noise. And when Steve Detweiler was talking about cross-correlating the signals, um, there might, <coughs> you know, you s not only do you want to cross-correlate them, but you also want to see this pattern that pulsars that are, say, separated by around 80 degrees should be somewhat anti-correlated in their response, whereas ones, you know, close to zero, 180, should be, you know, positively correlated in their response. So this is what we're looking for to make a detection. We want to see this pattern, and I'll show some results tomorrow, which uh, are our current measurements of this correlation curve, or our attempts to measure it. <coughs> Okay. Wow. That's Mhm. Mm I guess yeah, there's more signal down there but a lot messier to do the analysis. Uh <coughs> so in addition to calculating this correlation pattern, uh they used the um, the classical pulsars, the more slowly spinning ones, to update the bounds on the energy density in gravitational waves. And uh, back then, the kinds of timing precisions were anywhere between, you know, as two milliseconds down to the best were around 10 microsecond um, errors on the time of arrivals. <coughs> so by the mid 1980s, um, Cliff showed this yesterday. At some point. Uh, this uh, change in the period over time of, of uh, PSR 1913 plus 16 became uh, you know, a significant detection of, of uh, gravitational wave emission. And so that led to the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1993. But it was around, uh, yeah, you happily ce celebrating there. So that's, uh, uh, but it was sometime around the, you can actually track their papers where they went 
to the point where they finally said, you know, this is over a five sigma detection now um, as, as the data came in. Uh, now, the proposal to actually build a pulsar timing array was, uh, as far as I know, first proposed in a paper in 1990 by Foster and Backer, and uh, talking about, you know, getting a big collection of pulsars and then uh, looking for these correlations. And that effort, um, then starting fr uh, around that time, some pulsar timing efforts were really starting to get going. If you look at uh, the history, and I, I don't have updated versions of these graphs because uh, they run out in around, this one runs out in 2010 and this one runs out in 2012 or 2014. But you see the um, timing accuracy of the pulses over time has been steadily improving. And the number of pulsars, this is the International Pulsar Timing Array. Um, the number that have, uh, are being used has been, uh, have been discovered, has been steadily growing. And so, <coughs> and here's the distribution of, of known pulsars in the Milky Way. And you see it's like a galactic scale detector. I think we're roughly here somewhere. Um, these are not all millisecond pulsars, but it's just all the pulsars. So the trend has been the, the, uh, the accuracy with which we can time these pulses, pulsars has been getting better and better. The number of them has been uh, improving. And I'll say a little bit more tomorrow about how the number of pulsars and how, and the um, and the accuracy with which we measure the arrivals of the pulses actually factors into gravitational wave detection, how those scalings go. I'll cover that tomorrow. <coughs> uh, again, these slides are not fully updated, um, but uh, if you actually look at the bounds on the, um, this is just showing the early trajectory of how the bounds on the gravitational wave energy density went from the original Hellings and Downs paper and, th and then um, down through, and you see the steady improvement, we're now down, I forgot what number up right now, but it's way down here somewhere, 10 to the minus 13, isn't it, something like that. Um, and also we have predictions of, this is the amplitude from a stochastic background form, and I'll get to say more about this from a, a population of supermassive black holes. This was an earlier prediction, I think this might have been from, I can't remember if this was from Al one of Alberto's papers or these predictions here, but uh, these predictions have since gone down a bit. So um, we keep on pushing, but we're starting to get into the regime where the measurements are getting close to what seems like an astrophysically reasonable uh, strength for the for the background. So we're getting in close to detection territory. Okay, a little about the International Pulsar Timing Array. Um, one of the early pioneering uh, efforts was out of Australia with the venerable uh, Parkes telescope. So this is the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array. In the US, we have uh, for nanograv using the Green Bank Telescope, the largest steerable radio dish in the world, and now the second largest radio telescope, Arecibo, in Puerto Rico. Um, nanograv is now extending uh, to use additional facilities. I'll say a bit more of that in a moment. Uh, but these have been the workhorse for nanograv. And uh, the European Pulsar Timing Array uses a collection of telescopes um, scattered throughout Europe. And together, all combined, the idea is to put all the data together and analyze it jointly um, as part of the International Pulsar Timing Array. And those efforts are really uh, starting to ramp up now where we're going to have some of the first uh, combined analyses of all of the data from, from the different telescopes. <coughs> Looking just a little further ahead, there's uh, new telescopes getting um, uh, that are getting created. We now have FAST in China, now the largest radio telescope in it on Earth. It's also in one of these cast formations, one of these limestone slump type, um, the same sort of thing that uh, Arecibo is built in. And it's bigger. And then in, uh, there's a project in, in Canada called CHIME that's mostly going for early universe signals, but it can be uh, in software, you can make it into a, um, a pulsar timing instrument as well. There's Meerkat in, uh, in South Africa. It's an array of dishes. It's already doing some great pulsar timing um, work. And then going forward, um, extension beyond Meerkat 
to the square kilometer array, mostly in uh, South Africa with some outliers in Australia, which will give a very large integrated square kilometer type collecting area spread over many dishes. So there are more um, you know, larger radio telescope facilities coming online that we're going to be using. Okay, so what are pulsars and why do we focus on these millisecond pulsars? Now, first of all, um, I'm not a radio astronomer, just a disclaimer here, but these are some photos I took. I, I visited Arecibo and I've you know, visited SKA, right? So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be uh, playing a radio astronomer. Um, so there's Jody Foster at Arecibo and then at, uh, at the uh, VLA. So um, I have about as much, uh, much, as much qualification as Jody Foster as being a radio astronomer, um, having visited both of these sites. But uh, <laughs> I know lots of radio astronomers, though, so I'm just parroting what they've told me over the years. Uh, one of the things more seriously, though, is if, if you want to do any kind of gravitational wave data analysis, you really do have to have some understanding of how the instrument works and the, and the details of the noise and how it might affect your measurements and how it might masquerade as a gravitational wave signal. Um, in the case of pulsar timing, the, the noise sources are extremely complex. So an understanding and modeling the noise is, is a big challenge. So <coughs> uh, you really do have to take all of this into account when you try and use pulsar timing as a method to detect gravitational waves. All right, first of all, um, we have the sort of basic lighthouse model. So you've got a rapidly rotating neutron star, and then just like the Earth, it has a magnetic field, but the magnetic poles are not aligned with the rotation axis. <coughs> and so you basically have this uh, spinning approximate dipole type field. This dipole model actually um, just basic uh, graduate E&M or even undergraduate E&M type uh, model does a good job of being able to you know, predict the spin down rates even though it's more to do with the winds they're driving. But the idea is you've got this, um, you've got a time varying uh, magnetic field, which is producing electric field. So you set up in a large electric field, which then causes a pair cascade. So you're getting charged particles. So you, you're accelerating these charged particles to relativistic velocities in the magnetosphere of the neutron star. But it's a little unclear exactly where the emission um, comes from. It might be actually m some combination. So <clears throat> there are some models where the emissions primarily coming from near the light cylinder. So the light cylinder is, if you were co-rotating with the neutron star, it's the point at which you would have to be traveling at the speed of light to keep up with the rotation, right? So you can imagine the field lines have to get very bent there because, you know, they can't go faster than the speed of light. Uh, or it might be, the emission might be more coming from the polar caps. So it's it's still not a settled question of exactly how do pulsars create their, their radio beams. Um, and it might be some combination of these things. So th there, is, there is a lot of uncertainties about exactly how these radio beams are, are created, even today. But uh, for the purposes of pulsar timing, it turns out that we don't necessarily really need to know in detail how it happens. But uh, if we want to understand some of the noise sources, it would be good if we had better first principles understanding of the emission mechanisms. Um, and I'll also uh, we'll talk in a moment about the shapes of the pulses, so how they look in time. And we would understand the pulse profiles and their variation better if we actually understood this emission me mechanism in more detail. Um, so this is still a, uh, an area of active research, is, is exactly how do um, the radio beams get get launched. I mean, it's, it's basically, you know, a time varying b b uh, magnetic field producing an electric field, then you've got charged particles and they're going around in the magnetic field, you know, producing radio waves. That's sort of the basic story, but the details of how it all happens is still, um, still being looked into. <coughs> so this is a classical pulsar, PSR B03, that's the coordinates. <coughs> and that's a that's a cloud. <coughs> uh, it's 
so you can hear it. This is just basically taking the pulses and then playing them as sounds right as they come in, just the intensity. Uh, and here is the crab pulsar right in here. So this is a young pulsar because it's a supernova remnant, and uh, <coughs> you know we know that it's it's not been there for very long. And you can hear it <coughs> spinning much faster because it hasn't yet uh, spun down. <coughs> um, it's still it's still spinning down. <coughs> and here is a millisecond pulsar. This is. Uh, this is the zip code for this particular millisecond pulsar. That's, that's uh, the dot marks the location of the pulsar. <coughs> it's moving this way through the interstellar medium. Um, the pulsar, pulsars are formed in supernova explosions. They often get quite large kicks, so they can be zipping through the galaxy up to thousands of kilometers per second, right? So it's, it's going along. And then you've got, you know, the, um, this is a bow shock from from the, uh, I guess you've got the magnetic fields of the pulsar going through the interstellar medium. So you've got this bow shock here where it's uh, going, you know, plowing through the interstellar medium. And I forgot to update this one, um, but this one's buzzing away. <coughs> Whoops, went too far, sorry. Come back. I've got pulses coming in. Come on. Why is it not going back? Ah, here we go. All right. <coughs> so this pulsar is... <sighs> I keep on hitting the wrong buttons. something about the animation interfering with my ability to go back and forwards. All right. <coughs> okay, so it's <coughs> um, billions, it's 4.8 billion billion meters from the Earth, roughly. And for over a decade now, we've been tracking the distance, not the absolute distance, but the um, relative distance or the change in the distance to an accuracy of 30 meters. So about the size of one of the uh, trees out here, right? So we know the distance from the Earth to this pulsar to about this accuracy. Now, it's not as good as LIGO measuring, you know, the distance between the mirrors to, um, you know, fractions of the width of a proton, but uh, it is a lot further away. So it's a good fractional measurement, and the gravitational waves get much stronger at low frequencies. So this is the kind of, this sort of accuracy is... Um, what we need for detecting gravitational waves. So we're looking for variations between the distance in the Earth and this pulsar, you know, of order tens of meters caused by the gravitational waves. Um, now, <coughs> the remarkable thing is uh, we only, we, we don't have enough radio telescopes, enough time on the radio telescopes to observe these pulsars continuously. We don't even have enough to observe them every day. We can only observe them, say, every we try and observe them currently roughly every week or every couple of weeks, go back to a pulsar. But to do the gravitational wave detection, you actually need the complete phase-connected collection of pulses, right? You, you can't just, um, but with this pulsar timing model I'm gonna tell you about, um, so in two weeks, this particular pulsar will have completed this huge number of revolutions, right? But we know, exactly which one it's on when we restart the observation so we can tag that next pulse coming in you know coherently and connect it so you've got this um, stream of pulses and even though you don't observe it for all time you can actually put it and and you can fill in everything that you missed right uh, what it costs you is signal to noise if we could observe it constantly we'd have a um, uh, you know much lower timing errors because you'd have more data connect collected, but we know exactly which one is like the 210 millionth pulse, <coughs> which is incredible. And as Cliff mentioned yesterday, um, you can come back to these things years later and still tag the pulses, um, which one's which. Now, that accuracy for this particular pulse, uh, a single um, standard atomic clock, this one actually has about the same 
um, timing accuracy as a basic atomic clock. There are better atomic clocks, but the kind of basic atomic clocks that are currently set the time standard, actually, this, this pulsar is about as good as a, a standard atomic clock. Yes? For this one, um, well, this is changing very slowly because it's a recycled one. We have the, you can do the math on those period derivatives I gave you, right? So the, the rate of change of the period per time, and uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's very small changes. Uh, that was, I think, in the units I had was what, 10 to the minus 20 um, seconds per second sort of thing, right? Yes, that's right. <coughs> and in fact, <coughs> uh, I mean, there are better individual atomic clocks these days, but if you've been, you know, out to like NIST or something, they have like a, a room full of atomic clocks, and it's the average of all of those atomic clocks that actually define the time standard, because, you know, they do a root n kind of beating down at the errors in any one of the clocks. Um, plus, if anyone starts to drift off, they kind of throw that one out. <coughs> Right, so back to the pulsar demographics here, and here's the numbers for you again. I actually I took the uh, <laughs> I took the units off. Um, so we've got the slow, slowly slowing ones here, and the rapidly slowing. So these are the younger pulsars, like the crab. Um, but these are relatively slow spinning, and these are fast spinning. So how did they get from being slow spinning to fast spinning, and why are they slowly slowing? All right. So here's just a few of those that I showed you. There's the crab. There's, there's the other one that I showed you. That's in the camel constellation. And this is uh, the, that millisecond pulsar right there. That's one of the best timers. <coughs> Let me see where they sit. So these are the ones we use for gravitational wave detection. And the idea is, and the model that is that these are recycled pulsars. So they've actually accreted material off a companion, and in that accretion, they've actually spun them up. That ma accreted material also buries the magnetic field, and that's why they then, uh, they have lower magnetic fields. I guess that also makes them somewhat less bright, but they, that also reduces their spin-down rate. Yes? Oh, some that are spinning up? Yes. Yeah. There are some that are actively accreting that we we see. Yeah. They're not very good for pulsar timing because this accretion isn't necessarily completely steady. So, you know, it can be episodic to a certain degree. So you, it's a lot more than to model that whole accretion process. Even though a couple of them have been looked at right now. I was just at the IPTA meeting a few weeks ago in Albuquerque, and there was a couple of pulsars, millisecond pulsars, that are accreting, and they're actually looking at using those as part of the pulsar timing array and modeling the accretion and everything. And they think that they, they can do it accurately enough to put that into the timing model. But traditionally, they've been thrown out because it's added complications to the, to the model. So the basic picture here is that uh, <coughs> you have a couple of stars, one of them goes supernova, produce a, um, you know, a neutron star, and two things can happen. The binary that disrupts because of the kick that from the supernova explosion can actually send the neutron star off flying through the galaxy on its own, and then you get a young pulsar just isolated, and uh, we see them zipping across through the galaxy, uh, or the binary survives. Now the evolution of the star, and, and that can actually um, undergo this Rochelot overl overflow, and then you get a uh, X-ray binary, and that's when the you, you know the spinning up's happening. If this star is sufficiently um, heavy, then it also can undergo a supernova explosion. So we go off on this track. If it's um, if it's smaller, then we might end up with say a white dwarf, right? So the lower mass systems, you end up with a uh, millisecond pulsar white dwarf binary, and there's plenty of those known. High mass systems, you get eventually another supernova. It either disrupts, then you get what's known as a mildly recycled pulsar. These tend to be <coughs> not spinning quite so fast, um, or they survive as a binary, and then you end up with a double neutron star binary like that. So those are the, um, the sort of evolution pathways. 
And it's these here, these recycled pulsars that we actually use in gravitational wave detection. Um, about two-thirds of the millisecond pulsars that we use are in binary systems, either binaries with white dwarfs or other neutron stars, and that's consistent with this spin-up idea. <coughs> What's interesting is some of, them, uh, some of these millisecond pulsars are actually what are known as black widows, and they have very low mass companions, almost down to zero mass, because the pulsar winds are actually just ablating the companion, destroying the companion star, and just until, poof, it's gone, right? So it actually blows away the, the low mass star that it's orbiting around until it's sort of gone. Um, <coughs> so some of them can eventually become isolated just by completely destroying their companion. Uh, and that's based on the idea that black widow spiders, they eat their mates um, when they're done with them. <laughs> okay. Now a little bit about observing um, pulsars and how it's done. So the simplified diagram, we have the telescope, the receiver, these are cooled receivers. Um, <coughs> there's this, uh, I'll talk a bit about this dispersion, and then there's this online folding that occurs and then you have a reference clock and then you actually measure, um, you have a, the pulse profile and you pick some point where you, you match this to a template and then you measure the times of arrival, and I'm going to go through this a little bit. So you're basically trying to tag when each pulse arrives, but it's a lot more complicated than this simple diagram suggests. First of all, here is showing you, here's time along this axis in milliseconds, and here's pulse number. So this was one pulse, here's the next pulse, here's the next pulse. So this is just each different pulse. And you notice that they don't look very similar, right? So this is each individual pulse. Now, how do I time something when every, every pulse is kind of different? Like, where do I center on, right? How do I actually decide which parts, you know, do I line it up with this thing? Well, no, because it's not there on, on the next one, right? So this is the actual data looks like this. <coughs> and so what's done is, and this is a little movie, um, essentially what it's showing you is not this pulsar, but another one like it. It's taking these, and it's going to add up pulse after pulse. So this is an average over, say, tens of minutes. It should be a little movie. You can see that they add them up, add them up. And as you add it up, you get the average profile starts to get defined here. And actually, that's what we do each time, is we observe a, a given pulsar for about 10 minutes, half an hour, and then stack all the pulses together. And the stacked profile, which is this is the stacked profile for this particular pulsar, these are actually really quite consistent over time. So the average profile averaged over stacking thousands or you know, millions of them is actually quite a stable reference. And then that's what we actually tag as we line up from that half an hour set of observations, we line up this template with that. And that actually gives us the time of arrival of that. Yes? Well, this actually, it is, well, this is an average, but it's, <coughs> they actually, once we've established a, a reference template, it actually is used um, into the future. We, we do check occasionally to make sure that the, the reference template isn't changing too much, and that's a source of error, the fact that over time, eventually, these average profiles do start to, but they're actually remarkably consistent over, over years, even though the individual pulses are very messy. Um, but that is a source of error, the fact that these pulse profiles do slowly drift and change over time, and so you have to just check once in a while that things haven't moved too far away from the reference. <coughs> that's right. That's an, th there's a new method that's being looked at, which is um, <coughs> a Bayesian timing approach that uh, uh, Lindley Lentardi's been developing, where um, the, the timing's going to be done on individual pulses uh <coughs> rather than like defining a a stacked <coughs> but it's essentially stacking in a way because it's using a whole collection of them and sort of doing a fit to it but in a bayesian fashion rather this is a, a chi squared type analysis but it's just moving it over to a so a maximum likelihood it's essentially doing a bayesian version but using the individual pulses which effectively stacks them as well <coughs> Oh yeah, because over those, right, <coughs> over 10 minutes, but 
good question. Here is 20 minutes of data. So this is time here <coughs> in seconds. This is pulse phase here. <coughs> this is a binary pulsar. <coughs> and you see <coughs> that this pulse profile curves because of the binary orbit, because the binary orbit so relativistic. Um, so this is what you get, is get this big smear, and this is why the double binary, the, d the double pulsar wasn't discovered. The orbit smeared out the pulse so much that it wasn't observable as a pulse. So you had to be able to take this curvature out, and each individual, you know, wasn't, pulse isn't really bright enough to properly resolve here. So you have to, this is after you've corrected using the binary orbit model, then allows you to stack this together to make this pulse profile here. So for the very rapid binaries, you actually have to <coughs> use the um, binary orbit model before you can create your stacked um, pulse. <coughs> Here's an example of uh, 20 um, pulse profile templates that are used by the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array for these different pulsars here, and you see um, that these profiles are all pretty different. So different pulsars all have quite different um, pulse templates, and some are better than others for pulsar timing. For example, if you have a pulse profile that looks like this, this is great for timing because it's a very, you know, <coughs> clean shape, whereas if something's sort of broader, it's not quite so good, um, so you really want nice sharp features in your pulse profile for as well. So there's a lot of, lot of, uh, you know, a lot of variation in what we see for the pulse profiles. And these are at different radio frequencies, 10 centimeter, 20 centimeter. Okay, so the basic idea um, for pulsar timing as a gravitational wave detector is if you have a gravitational wave, changing the uh, photon path length between the, so then it arrives more, you know, arrives earlier or it arrives a little later because the pulsars, you know, this path length is changing. That's the basic idea, so that's good. Well <coughs> except there's some complications um, which we have to take into account in the timing model. So some of the complications are that the, a, a good fraction, about two thirds of these pulsars <coughs> are in orbits around a some companion, maybe another pulse, maybe another neutron star or a main sequence star or a white dwarf. <coughs> then the Earth um, is orbiting around the sun, so you've got to take that into account. And uh <coughs> also the radio waves are propagating through the interstellar medium, and so you get dispersion, the higher frequency um, radio waves arrive earlier than the low frequency radio waves and you have to also account for that. Plus there's all sorts of scattering that happens to the radio signals. Um, so there's many different effects that you have to take into account. I'm going to go through some of these. Uh, and in fact, the combination of all of them is really, uh, you could do an entire class on relativity just on pulsar timing because it has everything in it really. It's it's got it's very rich collection of uh, relativistic effects that that come in uh, especially at this binary orbits not not the Earth around the Sun so much. <coughs> All right, <coughs> so I'm going to break it down here. We have the observed arrival time, and it has m many different contributions. <coughs> First of all, there's the emission time at the pulsar of that pulse. <coughs> Then there's a collection of terms that go into Barry centering the signal. So the solar Barry center, center of mass of the solar system. <coughs> we, since the Earth's moving around the sun and because the Earth rotates, <coughs> the arrival time at a particular <coughs> radio telescope isn't that informative. We have to map that to a sort of more fixed reference, which is the center of the solar system, right? <coughs> so you have to Barry center your signal. You've got all these delays because of propagation uh, through the interstellar medium. ISM is interstellar medium. <coughs> and then you've got all of the um, corrections, all of the uh, timing delays due to the pulsar orbit and various relativistic effects, gravitational uh, <coughs> time delays and Shapiro time delays, that sort of thing. 
<coughs> so you've got all of these different terms here. I'm going to break them down uh, for you. <coughs> Let's start with <coughs> the Barry centering uh, terms. Well, there's some more related to just the observing apparatus with, you know, accounting for clock corrections, atmospheric delays. But then you've got these terms. Um, so there's the um, there's the Roma delay. That's just the geometric effect of where the Earth is in its orbit around the Sun, and where you know where that particular radio telescope is on the surface of the Earth. And the Earth's rotating, right? So that that just puts in a delay, just a geometrical delay. So that's the Roma delay because of the finite speed of light. <coughs> and what's important here is the model for where the Earth is relative to the center of the solar system, which is known as the ephemeris model. <coughs> and <coughs> it turns out that that, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that tomorrow, it turns out that that's, that's actually one of our dominant sources of error now, is we, see, we need to know where the center of the solar system is to better than 100 meter accuracy to do this. And the measurements we have from NASA and uh, European space probes and whatever, do not actually get as the accuracy we need. So now we actually have to s use the data from the pulsar timing array to solve for where the center of the solar system is. So we have to actually incorporate that now in our modeling. So we're actually now figuring out where the Earth is relative, you know, to the center of the, <coughs> the solar system. Um, there's the solar system Einstein delay. That's because of clocks running slower and deeper gravitational potentials, <coughs> and that's time varying. And then there's solar system Shapiro delays. If the radio signal comes <coughs> past a planet on its way to us or past the sun, it picks up a Shapiro delay. <coughs> and so we have to account for that, which again brings in the um, ephemeris model because you need to know where all the planets are at all times. So you can figure out what their paths were past every planet and, and, the, and every body in the solar system. <coughs> so that, and I'm going to go through these a little bit more. Okay. <coughs> Then we've got the interstellar medium. <coughs> well, there's just the vacuum propagation. That's a Roma type delay. But the problem is <coughs> the pulsars are moving through the galaxy, and the Earth and the Sun are moving through the galaxy. And so you have to take all that into account. Um <coughs> there's uh, dispersion, <coughs> as I mentioned, because uh, higher frequencies propagate at uh, <coughs> you arrive more more uh, earlier than lower frequencies, and that goes as one over the square of the frequency. <coughs> um, there's Einstein delays; these are special relativistic time dilation due to the relative motion of the of the pulsar and the solar system. So you have to include all of these. And as I mentioned, the details of all of these are given in that Tempo two paper that I had in my in my references, and it has has all of the equations for each of these. I'm going to give you a few of the equations in a minute. And then there's the pulsar frame corrections, which is basically barycenting the, the pulsar relative to the, you know, it's or if it's in an orbit, you have to reference the pulsar back to the center of mass of the system it's in. <coughs> so again, there's a Roma, Roma delay just from where, um, where it is in the orbit. And you actually, for quite a few of these systems, have to go beyond Keplerian. You have to go and include post-Newtonian corrections. Um, there's aberration um, because of the trans, well that should be transverse velocity, not transfer velocity. Uh, Einstein delay, again, the clock's running slower in deeper gravitational potentials. And again, the shear Shapiro delay, because basically the same thing's happening in the solar system as happening in the pulsar, except the pulsar is, a, is you know, in a more relativistic type orbit, so these effects are even bigger. But it's really the same at both ends, um, both, both the emitter and the receiver in orbit around things. <coughs> and then we've also got the emission time of the pulsar. The intrinsic period uh, is changing with time um, because this pulsar is spinning down. And so you can, uh, it's because it's slow, you can tailor expand it. So you've got the reference period, first derivative, second derivative, and you have to include that. And that uh, usually you don't have to go up to third derivatives, just up to second sufficient. <coughs> All right. If you get the period wrong, this is what your timing residuals look like over, <coughs> you just get a linear, that's when this was a case where the period in your model was actually greater than the true period, so you don't, you end up with an overall um, slope. <coughs> if, you, 
if you get the period derivative wrong, you end up with a big parabola in your residual. If you get the pulsar sky location wrong, you get a uh, periodic sinusoid <coughs> um, with periods of like a year. If you get the proper motion wrong, like the motion of the pulsar relative to the Earth, you get a modulated um, sinusoid. <coughs> and if you get ev everything right, then your residuals look like this, where it looks essentially <coughs> maybe like white noise or um, more likely some kind of red noise process <coughs> after you fit all those, those quantities. <coughs> I decided to throw in a few more details here. I've stolen all these slides from James McKee, who is a radio astronomer. <coughs> um, <coughs> so as I mentioned before, this is really pretty similar to what I had. This is the uh, this is the phase, and this is the timing model where you've got the period and the period derivative here. And this is, again, the errors. The linear error, if you've got the period wrong, and this is if you've got the period derivative wrong, you get a quadratic, so you've got to get those out. <coughs> <coughs> Source position, so you've got the, this is the Roma delay, so it depends on the vector from the solar system barycenter. Um, to the observer, so that's the connecting the Earth, and then you've got the unit vector from the solar system barrier center to the pulsar, and if you get this direction wrong, then you get this, uh, <coughs> this sinusoid. Then if you get the velocity wrong, so the pulsar's then moving across the sky, and you have to model that, and these can be quite significant, so um, hundreds to thousands of kilometers per second velocities, right? So you've got uh, the, the transverse proper motion, and that leads to a timing error that goes um, like this, and you see that, that ends up giving you this modulated um, sinusoid. <coughs> and then uh, for some pulsars, they're sufficiently <coughs> close to the Earth <coughs> that as you observe, say, from June to December, you actually get a parallax, and the wave fronts <coughs> um, <coughs> uh, arrive differently here than here, and you have to allow for this parallax, and if you don't, that leads to another error. But this is actually a good effect. This actually allows you to measure the distance to the pulsar. Um, so this is useful, gives you the distance to the pulsar, which is useful information. And in fact, for some pulsars, the distances are known really quite well. And uh, as I'll mention tomorrow, that's quite important for some of the gravitational wave analyses. So this is actually, it's a nuisance, but it's a, it's a, it's a useful uh, thing here because it includes the distance to the pulsar, so it gives you interesting information. <coughs> Ki uh, Cliff went over this yesterday. Uh, you've got the all the parameters associated with the orbit. Um, so just for Keplerian orbits, you have all of the usual um, quantities that describe a Keplerian orbit. This isn't even getting into the relativistic pieces that correct this. And so you have to include all of those in your fit. So again, this is sort of a nuisance because you have to include in your fit, but then you learn lots of things, right? You get the masses of the, of the systems, you get the orbital geometry, you get the eccentricity, so you learn a lot from this, and then you can start doing uh, tests of general relativity as well when you go beyond just this Keplerian model. So this is all good stuff, but you have to fit for all of these parameters for every system. So if you get these parameters wrong, they lead to various, very, uh, your, your timing residuals have these clear um, sinusoids and things in them. And for example, this is the the Roma delay just through because of the orbit. <coughs> then you've got other relativistic effects I was mentioning. So there's the Einstein delay, um, which comes from the, uh, the relative change because um, you've got the redshift because of the masses. And so you've got to, uh, again, this tells you a lot about the system, these various combinations of the masses. And you get a sinusoid in your signal again. <coughs> then you've got things like the aberration delay. Because the, they have high orbital velocities, you get um, the pulsar beam gets distorted by that. And so you've got to take that into account. 
and then you can actually measure these parameters which um, give you other ways to get at these um, orbital parameters. Then you've also got to take into account that some of these si systems are sufficiently relativistic that you're getting the, um, you have to take into account the fact that the period of the system is changing due to gravitational wave emission that has to be included wh while still, you know. So this is the crazy thing. You're trying to use these systems as a gravitational wave detector, but to do that, they're emitting gravitational waves so you have to model the emission of gravitational waves by your detector <laughs> before you can use <laughs> the, uh, the signals you've received to then look for other gravitational waves caused by something else, right? So when your gravitational wave detector is emitting gravitational waves, <laughs> it's, but that's, that's, and look at like all of these different effects, it's just a huge amount of special and general relativity going on in here. So uh, everything you learned in your general relativity and special relativity classes gets put to use here. <coughs> uh, another ge relativistic effect, a 1PN effect, is the, um, these s systems are sufficiently uh, relativistic that they get, they have quite large periastron advances. Um, and so you have to model the periastron advance. <coughs> So here we've got an example where the orbital plane, of course, you remember for, for Mercury on the Sun, it's this tiny periastron advance, right? Uh, whereas for these systems, they actually, the orbital planes are making full revolutions in, say, 21 years, and these observations that we're making go span decades. So, you know, uh, you have to take all of these things into account. And then uh, the Shapiro delay. So here's the geometry. We've got the pulsar here and its companion, and at different times in the orbit, you see here's a case where the pulsar beam is going right by the companion. This is almost a complete eclipse happening here, and you get this characteristically shaped uh, delay because now the pulsar beam is going through the gravitational potential of this uh, companion. In general, these companions, this is not drawn to scale, these companions are kind of tiny and you don't actually get any eclipsing. But in the case of the double binary, the magnetosphere of the companion actually um, does cause a, um, an actual eclipsing of the beam. But that's not typical, it's usually just a gravitational, it's just the gravitational potential that you're measuring. Here's the expression for the um, Shapiro delay and you've got this range parameter that Cliff was talking about and then this shape parameter, and then this is the form that you get for the Shapiro delay, and so by fitting to this, you can actually measure these range and shape parameters. So you have to include this um, in your modeling, and the same thing happens at the receiving end, as I was mentioning, as the radio beams come down, say, past one of the, um, you know, S Saturn or Jupiter, you get quite a big Shapiro delay that you have to account for on the receiving end as well. Got a couple of examples of that. So here is <coughs> the Shapiro delay for this particular pulsar when the pulse, when its pulse came in um, close to Jupiter, and you see the characteristic um, Shapiro delay here. And here's an example from a binary system where um, the before correcting for the uh, Shapiro delay, here's the timing residuals, and this is in microseconds. So this wouldn't be very good for pulsar timing because it would be, you know, tens of microseconds error. Um, but once you correctly account for the um, Shapiro delay, then this becomes, I think the scale must have changed here, uh, or changed from here to here and you see that we've completely taken that out and we now have a nice timer. There was an example a couple of years ago in the nanograv data set where there was a pulsar that a millisecond pulsar we'd been looking at using and had never been included in any of the analyses because its timing residuals were pretty crummy and then people kept on observing it though just in case it might uh, 
we might be able to get a solution that was better, and it was found that it was actually in a binary, which uh, initially it hadn't been um, seen that it was in a binary, and then once the Shapiro delay was taken out, it was a really very excellent timer and is one of the good pulsars that we're using now. But at first, we couldn't quite, it wasn't nearly as distinct as this one. Um, so it was just sort of messing up, creating noise in the measurement. But once we then were able to fit for the Shapiro delay, it's now one of our better timers. So uh, these effects can take a little while to resolve. <coughs> OK. <coughs> uh, so here is a plot showing the pulse phase in periods, so from 0 to 1, but as a function of the radio frequency. And notice that um, the arrival time of this peak here is dependent on the frequency. So um, in fact, it's on this, it's completely wrapped. So if you what we want to do is we want to collect, if we only observed a pulsar in a very narrow band of frequencies, then this wouldn't be such a problem. But we want to stack together as much power as we can, so we want to actually observe over very wide radio bands. But if you want to combine the data across, you need to actually take out this, um, this dispersion so that you can then all stack the pulses. This is similar to what I showed earlier where it was actually the... Uh, at a single frequency, the way that the a binary caused the pulses to, you know, move around in uh, in time, here we actually have them moving around in frequency, and so to stack it, we actually have to take this out. So you actually have to solve for this quantity d, which is the dispersion measure. It depends on the distance to the pulsar and the column density of electrons along the line of sight to that pulsar, right? And so we use this as a proxy for distance when we don't have parallax measurements. <coughs> and so what, what is actually done now is essentially using GPUs, like in a PlayStation, um, th that uh, it used to be that we did narrow band timing. So this is the frequency range in gigahertz. And so this was at uh, um, Arecibo, I guess. Puppy, yeah, uh, Puerto Rico. So yeah, and then we switched to wideband receivers, so now covering a much larger range. And if you look at it, there's the, there's the radio pulse signal if you only observe this pulsar in this little tiny narrow band. If you observe over this wideband, you now pick up way more signal, right? But you've got this big curvature to the path, but you have to take that out. <coughs> you can't record the data that... Um, and send it away for analysis, you have to do this on the fly because it's just way, the data rate's way too high, right? It's like terabytes per second sort of thing. So you you actually have to do the de-dispersion, removing that curvature um, on site as you're taking the data for each pulse, right? So that's happening. This is done with these, this, these GPUs and th this is de-dispersed and you see that when we went from narrowband timing, these were the red, um, uh, these are the error bars on the arrivals using the narrowband, and now you see with the wideband, um, it has significantly reduced the measurement errors because we're now grabbing so much signal, but we can only do that because of an increase in computing power. We wouldn't have been able to use this wideband information because we couldn't have de-dispersed it without using GPUs. So it's another example of, and this is actually more similar to what Bruce was talking about back when, when we couldn't actually record at a high enough cadence. Here we couldn't have um, recorded with this kind of bandwidth and de-dispersed it without using. And so there's a bank of GPUs right on site at, uh, if you go to Arecibo and there's a similar one at Green Bank, and it's sort of essentially part of the instrument, right? Because Right, so the um, <coughs> so we're you know we're, we're going back to the same pulsars over and over, right? There's a dispersion measure that's known for that pulsar. It does change with time, 
and I'll get to that in a second, but it's pretty com but you know, essentially there's space weather. I mean, there's the interstellar medium, there's blobs of material kind of moving along. So it does change with time, but it doesn't change that rapidly with time. So you've got an initial solution that's already pretty good. And you know, you know, so you're able to, uh, you know, start pretty close to the right solution. And I guess you can refine it from there, but you, it, you pretty much have the correct dispersion measure to begin with, right? So you've, you've already got, you already know what you need to apply and you could probably tweak that a bit to make sure you've stacked all the power, right? Probably a little bit of an optimization, but they don't change. The dispersion measures, you know, don't tend to change dramatically like week from week, but it, they do change. So we have the dispersion measure already for every, you know, every pulsar. Uh, so here's an example of that actually. Here's the dispersion measure. This is the D quantity over time um, against some reference value. So this is the DMX, so this is the difference relative to the reference value, right? Um, and you can see that it sort of drifts a bit over the years, but this is relative to your reference value and your reference value, you know, still de-disperses things pretty well and then you can refine that to get the measurement of that dispersion. So this is something that has to be taken into account in the analysis um, that the dispersion measure is a function of time, that there's space weather, basically. <coughs> and there's all sorts of scintillation and other issues. Um, <coughs> so just a final little bit on some of the other noise sources that we have to contend with. Um, <coughs> so you've got your receivers, um, and so that's basically, you know, it's called radiometer noise, uh, and that's just your ability, you know, in, in the measurement of the, uh, of the radio, radio signal um, is a noisy measurement, so you want a very low um, uh, antenna temperature, the, uh, when I was just down in um, Albuquerque, we went out to the VLA and <coughs> they were showing us where the, um, where the liquid helium and whatever gets pumped up to cool the receivers and then they have these chillers and, and whatever. So they, they have to cool the antennas to try and reduce this radiometer noise. Um, the this pulse jitter, so these pulse profiles aren't exactly stable over time, so you can get, you know, that, see if the pulse profile isn't exactly, this, if isn't exactly fitting the template, that's a noise source because you're using that reference temp template to figure out when it arrived, and so we get sort of pulse jitter, um, and the individual pulse is not exactly fitting the template, uh, that's a sort. And then, as I was mentioning, we've got the interstellar medium, and it causes all sorts of scatterings <coughs> and uh, and scintillation, and, and that's a source of noise as well. <coughs> These are typically white noise, and this is sort of indicating their possible relative, you know, <coughs> uh, importance. <coughs> and uh <coughs> here's sort of an illustration. We've got the emitted pulse. It's going through some sort of scattering screen and that then means the detected pulse gets broadened and depending on what the scattering screen it's going through, um, this pulse shape can actually change due to changes in the scattering screen. And there's a lot of interesting work going on that actually is now modeling these screens and solving for them. So fully modeling, not just accepting it as a noise source, but saying we're gonna model this as a deterministic process, fit for it and do better um, can uh, kind of reconstruct what the emitted pulse is and get rid of this spread. So that's, uh, that's where some of the analysis is going now. Um, <coughs> so the white noise components aren't so damaging for gravitational wave detection, but the red noise um, components are because the prediction is that the gravitational wave signal that we would expect from a collection of um, supermassive black holes should be a very um, red spectrum. So peaking, you know, has a spectral slope. And so if there are noise sources that have a, a red spectrum, 
they can mimic more a um, gravitational wave signal. So our, if it's a, these um, have not converted probably, that's supposed to be 13 divided by three. Uh, so a, if you have a system of black hole binaries and circular orbits, um, a population of those, you would expect um, your timing residuals to go to f to the minus 13 thirds powers. I'll say a little bit more about this tomorrow, how we calculate that. <coughs> so this is what we're looking for, is a spectrum at, with this spectral slope, but it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, but if you have various other noise sources, for example, the, the variations in the interstellar medium go with somewhere like an f to the minus 8 thirds type power, and then spin noise. Um, the spectrum actually isn't f to the minus 5. It varies from pulsar to pulsar. But there's various other um, you know, things like spin noise. So we have lots of other red processes that can be mistaken for a um, gravitational wave signal. But the thing that would distinguish some kind of uh, red noise process that's not due to gravitational waves is that this particular component here has this characteristic correlation pattern between pulsars on the sky. So that's how we ultimately hope to, uh, to separate these gravitational wave signal from these other red noise processes is not by spectral separation, but by uh, the fact that they have a different characteristic correlation pattern. And I think that's it for today. I finished just a little early, so I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. <coughs> Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. That's right. 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 Nope. Um, you're right. There has to be a um, because you've had to stack them. You've got thousands and thousands in there, right, or millions in there. Uh, I mean, I guess you could. I mean, if you took it at the, say, at the center of the observation time, then you're, you're referencing that particular pulse. I don't know if Alberto knows the answer. Um, but yes, since each one essentially, you know, is tagged, there, ha there still has to be a reference as to where you're... Um, <coughs> I mean, for some pulsars, you can't actually really even dis distinguish individual pulses, right? So sometimes you actually have to stack several of them before you can even actually measure anything that's there. Time. Because yeah, I know that when people are actually solving, they have to put pi on two phase, two pi, sorry, phase jumps in to get the solutions to connect. So that's probably the business of actually lining up the center of that stack. Um, because you, you're out by, you, you, you come out wrong by factors of two pi and you just keep on adding in n times two pi until you get to get the stack to line up. So I think that they that's how they align the stack. Yeah. Yeah, but but no, these are completely phase connected.
Right. No, they they definitely they definitely are phase connected. It, we know really we, and so <coughs> I think that must be what those two pi wrappings that go in the analysis are about. It's like figuring out exactly where to stick the stack in the in the collection. But it is it isn't yeah they are not slopping around by that factor. They they do really connect them. But I hadn't really yeah I'd kind of thought about that before and. Should ask one of the radio astronomers that actually knows the answer. So I was pretending I was playing in a radio astronomer today. <laughs> yes. Right. Oh, you mean for the actual emission mechanism? Uh, well, there's relativistic effects, obviously happening there, because. But I, you know, it's I would I would think you can get away with a. Um, I mean, those are sort of probably separate from the electromagnetic aspects of the problem, like the the details of the magnetosphere and the pair cascades and things like that. I mean, I think you can then fold in you know, your relativistic effects in terms of what it does mostly for propagation and changes in frequencies, and uh, but I actually don't know for sure, but they're relatively, you know, they're 10% type effects. I think what's not just understood is just the messy astrophysics of what's happening in this plasma with the electrons, that, that part of it, not, but if you got further along, then you would want to include, you know, uh, any relativistic effects on the, but I think just, it's it's understood to a lesser level than that, right? The uncertainties are more in the um, in in the pulp, you know, the the actual structure of the magnetic fields and the magnetosphere and that sort of thing. Yes. There are some ideas about the spin noise. Um, people have some models. I don't. I again, I'm not not an expert on any of this part of it. Uh, y if you know something about um, pulsars, they're pretty incredible in terms of their. You know, they have these superfluid interiors, and then they also have, you know, a certain amount of uh, charges in there. So it's actually can be like a superconductor which means that the magnetic field inside gets confined into vortices and then these vortices pin to the crust in various ways and then <coughs> you know and then the angular momentum also is quantized in vortices and so these vortices again are connected into the crust where it's not a superfluid and then you can get pinning and unpinning of these and so uh, the magnetic fields inside are all tangled up, the crust is deformed in various ways. So there are some thoughts about um, how the, the spin's connected with some of the, this internal dynamics of what's happening with these vortices and the crust. And, but I, and there's certainly some, some models out there. One of my colleagues in Montana, uh, Bennett Link, works on this sort of thing. I've heard, heard him give lots of talks. He seems to have different models um, each time he gives a talk, but uh, it's, people are definitely looking at what might be causing some of this spin noise but uh, I don't think it's again it's not it's not fully understood why the spin noise this is separate from just the s you know the slowing down it's like why does it jitter around a bit right um, and I should say that for the millisecond pulsars they're much more stable and much less noisy than a classical pulsar classical pulsars have really significant spin noise and it's actually very difficult to measure the spin noise in a lot of these millisecond pulsars. We're not even sure if some of them are even show any spin noise. There are some that have been observed for a very, very long time. I forget the name of it. There was one particular pulsar that the Parkes um, Pulsar Timing Array sees down in the Southern Hemisphere that we don't have uh, uh, for like Nanograv or EPTA. And it had been the best timer and it was the one that was driving the bounds that we could set on the, um, that they were setting on the gravitational wave background, 
but more recently, it's now showing signs of like intrinsic red noise, like spin noise, but it didn't for like 20 years, but it was just that you couldn't resolve it until you collected data for so long. So for some of them, they're starting to show some signs of spin noise. It's much more evident in the classical pulsars, the more slowly spinning ones, but it might not be the same, right? Because they're so different, their magnetic fields are configurations are so different. So if you understood spin noise in a classical pulsar, it doesn't mean that you necessarily understand it from a millisecond pulsar. So uh, it's, it's definitely an unknown that, and we're starting to hit up. It's one of those things as you push down in sensitivity, you know, noise sources that you didn't worry about before start becoming a problem and we're reaching, you know, as our sensitivities have improved and improved with pulsar timing, uh, we're now starting to run into things like spin noise showing up in some pulsars we didn't think had any spin noise. So we're starting to see red noise now in quite a lot of pulsars that we thought were very clean. So, all right, thank you.